Lucas, great pride for me to welcome you to the I Squared seminar series. Thank welcome. you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to stand in front of you today. And, and just like you've already been told, we're going to go on a journey, right? And, and I'm going to start us out on this journey on, on what we call a race, okay? I've tried to kind of frame this talk or frame this time for us in terms of um, obliterating obstacles. I want us to think about how we obliterate obstacles and how we get up and how we win our individual races. And there's going to be a, a few words that I'm going to share throughout successive um, portions of our talk here. And I'd like to begin uh, with a poem called The Race. Quit, give up, you're beaten. They shout at you and plead. There's just too much against you now. This time you can't succeed. And as I start to hang my head in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of a race. And hope refills my weakened will as I recall that scene where just the thought of that short race rejuvenates my being. It's a children's race, young boys, women, young men, how I remember well. Excitement, sure, but also fear. It wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope, each thought to win the race, or if not tie for first, at least take second place. The fathers watch from off the side, each cheering for his son, and each boy hoped to show his dad that he would be the one. The whistle blew and off they went, young hearts and hopes of fire. To win and be the hero there was each young person's desire. And one boy in particular, whose dad was in the crowd, was running near the lead and thought, man, my dad will be so proud. Think about your race. Think about where you all have been. Think about where you want to go. and Think about how you're going to get there. It was in one of these contemplative moments that I found myself. The day was uh, Thursday, May 29th, 2008. I'm 28 years old, and I find myself on this really, really cool plane, right? Sitting on the, the right side of Air Force One, looking off the wing, and I'm trying to reflect on my race, as I'd like for you all to reflect on your race today. And I'm trying to reconcile uh, being born to a drug and alcohol addicted call girl who's 19 years old, who abuses her her body to get money to buy drugs. I, I try and reconcile being on that plane with growing up with the latent uh, choices that she made making their way through my body with developmental delay. I try and reconcile being on that plane with, with flunking kindergarten, failing, with struggling with school, with math, with concepts. I try and reconcile being on that plane with that first few years of life. Now, May 29th, 2008 wasn't just any ordinary day. Um, it was a special day. You know, I was working for the President of the United States. It was, it, was, it was heady, it was cool, but it was also really, really, really humbling. Because, you know, I thought of, of how life began for me. You know, my real birthday is, is May 19th, 1979. And 10 days later, on May 29th, 1979, I was delivered to the doorstep of this foster care home. Premature, weighing about four pounds, two ounces, born six weeks premature, not knowing how life would unfold with the circumstances that I'd been dealt. And yet I found myself 28 years to the day that I was delivered to the doorstep of this wonderful person called Dorothy McGuire on this incredible aircraft called Air Force One. And I frame that for you so that you can begin to reflect on your individual races. And I'd like for you all to think about what brought you all to this moment, what brought you all to this place, 
what brought you all to this time? Because all of us have a diverse and different story. All of us have had obstacles. All of us have had challenges. All of us have had incredible opportunities. And all of us also have been given this internal seed of desire to do something and to be something a little bit better than who we are or where we came from. And so I'd like for you to start as, as we begin our time together reflecting on the race. And I want to talk about the person who got me through my race. This is my uh, adopted mom. Her name is Dorothy. And over the course of about, gosh, 15 years, she had over 40 foster care children. Uh, she adopted six of us. Uh, she had four of her own and uh, remarried my stepfather when she, I was in about fourth grade, and so he had three girls. So in all, at, at, at one point, uh, we were a big family of 13. But also, when I was about six years old, my mom was a single mom um, of about 11 children. All right? And this was this other photo here of, of me as hopefully a cute little kid in your eyes, right? Uh, is at age almost three, it's adoption day, it's March 17th, and uh, apparently bow ties and that kind of outfit was in in the 80s, right? Um, but I thought of the one person on, on this earth that, that got me through that, that got me through this rough start in life, that got me through growing up with struggles in school, and this person that, that made all of this possible. So some common obstacles that, that all of us will face, whether it's not having enough money, the financial aid game, right? Uh, this academic progress, this hard to capture concepts, whether it's finances, whether it's our home life, whether it's maybe we didn't come from the right side of the streets or, or, or we don't have a family with incredible amounts of money to get us where we want to go, or maybe there are dreams that are deferred, uh, or Maybe it's just as simple as being turned down for interviews and trying to, in this very difficult economy, um, get a fresh start or a foothold in this new global economy. All of these are obstacles. And as I thought about this, I had this thought that I want to read for you. Uh, some of the times in life that bring us the most joy are preceded by the hardest. And it's a confirmation that if something is really worthwhile, it will more often than times require sacrifice, it will require setbacks, it will require discouragement, but also it will require an abiding faith. So as, I, as we begin our journey, as we begin our race over the next 25 minutes, I want to frame for you that all of our races are different, but I want to ask how in our individual races we can stand up and we can stand out. How can we run a race and win in a world that is looking for people to fail. So there are five decisions I believe that we need to make. First, we have to decide that we're built for something more. We have to decide to believe what's, what's possible. We have to decide to live life at a higher level. We have to want to win more than we're afraid to fail, which is a hard one. And last but not least, we have to decide to get up each and every time that we, that we fall. So launching out here, um, this deciding that we're built for something more. And I tried to frame these five decisions in terms of things that take place in our head first. Because any obstacle, and you all know this, and, and all of the hard work that you guys are doing in college, and believe me, I know how hard it is, I just finished my, my graduate degree at Rollins with an MBA, 19 months of every single Saturday, right, going, going to school. And I know how hard it is, especially when, for me, my undergrad was in political science, right? So political science and speech communication. But I decided I was going to transfer all that, which wasn't really transferable, into this business degree. So I know how hard it can be to think about and to try and be successful in a new environment. And so as we frame the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I want you all to think of it in terms of a decision. And I have this picture of a garden because our minds are like a garden. And whatever we allow to grow there will grow. You, you've probably heard this phrase, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right? 
So whatever you allow to dominate your mind will likely either come out in an action or in the attitude that helps frame a circumstance. So there will always be weeds in life. You know, all of you have seen farms, you've seen these types of things, you've seen gardens, and there will inevitably be weeds that will grow up. And the great challenge that we have and the great opportunity that we have is to be able to take that garden and to pull out those weeds with willpower and to, and to take incredible action towards making sure that what comes into our life and what comes out of our life is as a result of what seeds we allow to dominate our mind. And then we talk about this phrase called built for something more. And this is our family growing up. I told you a little bit about us before. Um, but we are a very diverse family, just like this room, all right? Um, I'm on the, on the far right there with, with the red shirt on and the big hair. Um, mom is in the middle, and I, I told you before, that's our family of 11. I'm six years old. But mom didn't just adopt those who were small babies like me. She adopted teenagers. Uh, she took in those who had uh, disabilities. So my, my brother in the middle there with the, with the brown pants um, incredibly smart, uh, paralyzed from the waist down because of the choices that his mom made while she was pregnant with him. Um, died early in life as a result. My sister Leslie, uh, 37 years old, has the mind of a three-year-old uh, because, again, of the choices that her mother made while she was in the womb. But it didn't matter whether we were old or young, whether we had disabilities or not, whether we were white, whether we were black, Mom taught us a very simple principle, and it was that we were built for something more. And she sowed these seeds into our mind that it didn't matter what obstacles we came with, didn't matter that we didn't know who our father was or that our mother was perhaps, you know, a, a call girl. None of that mattered. What mattered is what we believed about ourselves and what we believed about our potential moving forward. So as we launch out into this journey on this race, the first thing that you have to grasp if you're going to overcome obstacles is that it begins in your mind. And it begins about how you believe and how you think about yourself. This next one, we have to decide to believe what's, what's possible, right? We have to believe in the possible. So right after we believe that, that we have a God-given, inalienable right to be successful, we then have to believe what that tells us for the next step. And one of my favorite quotes is from Robert F. Kennedy when he said that there are some people who will see things as they are and they will ask why. But then there are others who will dream things that can be and ask why not. So I want to unpack this a little bit for us. There are some people in life that will see that, man, I don't have enough money to go to college. I came from the wrong side of the tracks. Um, I, I can't get it all together. I don't have the right GPA. And they'll use all of those things as excuses to shrink from the opportunity of the moment. But then there are those who will see all of those obstacles, right? They'll see that maybe they come from the wrong side of the tracks, uh, that they don't know anybody famous or important to help them get to where they want to go. Um, but they will, they will dream things that can be, and they will ask why not. It's the difference between those that will see mountains that are too high to climb, but they'll still try and climb them. It's the difference between those who will see oceans that are way too wide to cross, but they still will try and cross them. It's the difference between those who will shrug their shoulders and do nothing, and the difference between those who will see all of those obstacles, see all of those challenges, and say, you know what, why not? I'm very, very thankful that I had a mom uh, that told me to always ask, why not? And 18, 19 years of age, uh, I'm... I'm getting ready to graduate, I'm walking up the aisle, we finished this graduation, mom pulls me aside and she asks me really this kind of the same question that I kind of started out with you all today. She said, Lucas, what's next? What do you want to be and how are you going to get there? And the question for you, you know, you guys are sophomores, juniors, seniors, you're about to get these degrees, you're about to, to launch out into this global economy. What's next? What do you want to be? And how are you going to get there? All right? 
thankfully, you know, mom sowed these seeds of, of empowerment inside me at a very young age. And so I thought about this for a moment. I grew up in 1990s, and this was 1998 when mom asked me this question. I'm 18, I'm 19 years age. And I said, mom, you know, I know we don't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, have, I know nobody in any political party. You know, I remember being, um, I remember being in Washington, D.C., right, 16 years of age. It was a church youth group, and I remember going to the United States Capitol. I remember standing in the well of Congress and watching all these different people do their thing and saying, man, this is a special place. I want to be here. 16 years of age. Same night, we uh, went to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I remember walking up to the, this 18 and a half acres of the most powerful symbol of democracy on the face of the planet. It's nighttime. There's lots of people hustling and bustling. So, uh, there's a black wrought iron gate that goes around the entire White House. And I remember walking up to this gate, uh, this picture right here, uh, looking towards, towards the White House saying, man, one day I want to be on the inside. You know, No political connections. I knew nobody famous from any political party. But I said, Mom, I want to work at the White House. Right? And then um, there's this movie that came out in 1997 called Air Force One. Right? Harrison Ford, Russians take over the plane. Um, you know, he comes and saves the day. I remember the night that this movie came out, I was in the front row of this movie theater. All my friends, right? And I said, Mom, I want to fly an Air Force One, right? Now, granted, there are, are two identical planes, 747, um, Boeing engineered planes that, you know, if you guys keep going in life, you might design and engineer the next ones because they're kind of old, right? Uh, this was, uh, they were renovated in the last four or five years, but the first ones rolled out in 1989 um, when George H. Bush was president. Um, but these can travel halfway around the world without refueling. They can refuel in midair. There are two kitchens on board. The president has his own apartment on the plane, um, his own conference room on the plane. There's flat screen TVs everywhere. So. When I thought about this dream, I was not thinking about a, a, a flight on Southwest or AirTran, right, um, or JetBlue. And, and if, I don't know if any of you all ever watch MTV and you've ever seen that show called Pimp My Ride, uh, but this is about as pimp as you can get <laughs> in the sky, right? And I said, Mom, you know, I don't, I don't, we don't know anybody. I don't know anybody famous. You know, I have no connections at all, but I want to fly on this plane. I just spoke it, right? I believed in the possible. And then the, the last thing I wanted to do, and you guys can kind of tell I'm like five foot seven on a good day, right? <laughs> With heels on, uh, not girl heels, but like guy heels, right? Um, and Michael Jordan was my hero. This is a guy who, as you all know, um, was cut from his high school basketball team. So he started very early in life with a lot of obstacles. And if he would have ever quit right then and there when he was, when he was cut from his high school basketball team, we would have never known him as the greatest player uh, in both his and the current generation. We never would have known his name. But he is a person who believed, again, in the possible. And I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and I loved basketball, and I loved his story for what it represented for the obstacles that I had to overcome. And I told Mom, look, I have no grand illusions. He's six foot six. You know, Dwight Howard, 6'10", 6'11", Kobe, 6'8", you know, LeBron, 6'10", whatever. These guys are, are built for playing. But I know there's more to what you see on the court, and I want to I wanna work for, I told her at the time, I was like, I want to work for the Chicago Bulls, right? And, and mom told me a very simple phrase that I will offer to you that you've already heard before many, many times in your life. And she said, Lucas, you can do anything you put your mind to. If you're willing to come up with a plan of action, believe in the possible, and take enormous action towards your goal, mom never guaranteed me success, right? She said, I, I can't guarantee you success, but I can guarantee you that the likelihood for your success will be that much greater. So we have to decide to, to believe that we are built for something more. We have to weed our gardens. We have to overcome our minds, essentially. Uh, but secondly, we have to decide that we will believe in what's possible, not in what everyone's telling us is not possible, but what is possible itself. Back to our poem. And one boy in particular, whose dad was in the crowd, was running near the lead and thought, my dad will be so, so proud. 
But as they speeded down the field and across a shallow dip, the little boy who thought to run fell and slipped. Trying hard to catch himself with hands flew out in brace, and amid the laughter of the crowd, he fell flat on his face. So I read that stanza to frame this initial, this next thought. And it's a very, very important thought, a very, very important principle. We have to decide to want to win more than we are afraid to fail. We have to decide that. Because there's lots of people pulling at us. There's lots of people that tell us we can't do things. And we've all had experience with setbacks and failure. And so human condition, human behavior is so predictable that when you fail at something, you don't really want to try and do it again. It's human nature, right? But I offer this, this principle. The torpedo, you know, it, the torpedo is this missile that accomplishes itself by correcting itself through failure. A torpedo isn't going in a straight line towards its target. A torpedo, the way it's designed, literally is shot out and it continually corrects itself until it hits its target. So, in essence, the torpedo fails several, several times before we have a big explosion. Too many of us are, are, are not living our dreams because we are living our fears. And I want you all to think about, in your individual races, you know, this tug of war between fear and faith, between resolve. And, you know, I had it, and I, I've heard it framed this way. If you are afraid to fail, you have failed already, okay? If you are afraid to fail, you have failed already. And I'll tell you just a very personal anecdote um, that's very, very recent in my life. So I've, I've gotten my MBA, right? And I think that I'm going to go make a lot of money, okay? Because right, that's what you're supposed to do when, when you get an MBA for some reason. Um, and I get these calls, um, it's after the election, it's November, um, for five days straight, I get a call from a different individual every single day. They're saying, Lucas, you know, we, we, you know, you've been batted about in these circles, people are talking about you, and they'd like for you to consider running for office. And I'm like, first off, I haven't finished my MBA. I got a month left, right? And I was like, uh, I can't really think about anything right now except for finals. And I got this huge presentation on this startup that I got to do. So I can't, I can't think about it, you know? But then this, these little seeds of doubt. Remember I talked about weeding our garden? You know, all these people are saying you, can, you should run for office, Lucas. You should do this. You should do this. You have, you have a story to tell, and, and, and Central Florida needs your type of service at this time, right? I'm thinking about this, and, I, and people are like, well, what are your concerns, right? And I'm like, actually, I'm afraid I'll fail. I'm afraid I'll run. I've never run before, right? I'm a young guy. I've never run a race before. I've been a part of a presidential campaign, but it's a little bit different when you're the candidate, right? And they told me this thought. They said, Lucas, if you are afraid that you're going to fail, you have failed already. You will have great opportunities in front of you over the course of the next 5, 10, 20 years, and they're going to be scary opportunities. And there's no guarantee of success, but there is this guarantee that if you are afraid to fail, you have failed already. And one of the great hurdles of life uh, along this, this race that each and every single one of you are on is that there will be these obstacles, there will be these hurdles, and you don't know if you have enough legs to jump over this hurdle. But if you don't run and if you don't try, you will never know the result. Want to win more than you are afraid to fail. And of course, I told you about Michael Jordan, right? This is a guy who was cut from his high school basketball team. And I love this quote, and I, and I want to read it for you all. You've probably seen this commercial. He, he says, you know, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. He's lost over 300 games. Uh, 26 times he was entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and he missed. This is Michael Jordan. Because all we ever see is these great highlight videos of him hitting these game-winning shots. But no one ever talks about all the games that he missed and all the times when there's 1.4 seconds left, there's 0.5 seconds left, and Michael Jordan is saying, give me the ball, and he bricked. But he says the, the, the secret to his success is, is that he allowed himself to experience every single one 
of those moments, both the good and the bad. Michael Jordan now owns the Charlotte Bobcats. He didn't just end with playing basketball, he now owns one of 30 NBA teams. He doesn't do that if he quits when he's 16, and he doesn't do that if after 300, maybe 299 games, maybe 250 games, he's like, you know what, I'm kind of tired of losing. Maybe I should just quit while I'm ahead. If you have that mentality, it can't overcome the obstacles of life along this race. All right? This is uh, one, of my, one of my favorite principles, that you decide to live life at 212 degrees. Okay? So... We're going to do a little bit of an audience exercise for you. I won't have you stand up, but I will have you, if you everyone could just raise your hands for me, as high as you can. It's hard to do in this suit, but I'll do it, all right? <laughs> raise your hands as high as you can, okay? All right, now look over at your, your, your neighbor. All right. Now raise them just a little bit higher. Everyone see that? Look around. Now raise them just a little bit higher. All right, you're fully stretched. All right, put your hands down. <laughs> so my major is not science, but I do have a scientific principle for you, okay? And it's this. At 210 degrees, at 210 degrees, water's just hot, all right? 211 degrees, it's hotter still, but it's only at 212 degrees, which is the scientific point at which water boils. Water does not boil at 209. Water doesn't boil at 210. It doesn't boil at 211. It only boils at 212 degrees. So as we think about obstacles, as you think about your race, you're not going to win at 209. You're not going to win at 210. You're only going to win, you're only going to be able to overcome your obstacles, overcome your hurdles, when you live life fully stretched out at 212 degrees. You won't always be able to do it. And, and I am the first one to attest to it. There are days when I'm like, man, this is a 196 degree day, right? And we've all had those days. And it's hard to live full throttle at all, at, at all times. I get it. But when you have obstacles, when you have challenges, when you have these great opportunities in front of you, when it's 2013 and we have a global economy and, and there is a need of engineering, there's a need for science, technology, engineering, and math all across not just Central Florida, not across just this state, but ag across this nation and across the world, there is no better time to live life at 212 degrees because you guys are who everybody wants. And the person who will live at 212 degrees will be that person that gets that amazing job, will be that person that maybe designs that $100 million development or that next new arena or maybe that next Air Force One. But you got to live at 212 degrees. I'm going to tell you a story about a person who, who did this. She's my dear friend. Her name is Kelly Wells. Okay? She lives in Claremont, Florida. And she had some obstacles and some hurdles in her life. At age 16, she lost every, uh, all of her, her entire world collapsed. You know, she has a curfew. Her curfew is 11 o'clock. She's driving home, and, and she passes this wreck, this accident. And she's so scared because she has to get home or she's going to get in trouble, and her parents are waiting for her. She finally gets home. It's about 1230. It's past the curfew. She's sweating bullets, but her parents are at home. Come to find out that accident that she passed was her parents. And she lost both of her parents on the same night. That's a person who has been given a lot of obstacles. And the world would think nothing, nothing of it if Kelly Wells had just, you know what, this is a hurdle that's a little bit too big for me. I'm just going to ride the rest of life out. Life expected nothing of Kelly. But she's a person that began to run her race. She's a person that began to run hurdles, physical hurdles. She became a professional runner. And she says this, I trust that my purpose and my destiny, and I believe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Ranked number one worldwide, just represented us at the Olympics. And she ran hurdles. She got the bronze medal at the Olympics. 
not because she uh, is, has a special talent, although she does, not because, you know, luck just gave it to her, but because she understood what obstacles were in life, she faced those obstacles, literal hurdles, and she began to run. She began to run her race. All of us will have those times when we think we're running really, really good, and we slip and we fall, and the race keeps going, right? For the person that will be successful, for the person that will be able to overcome obstacles and eventually win their race, that will be the individual, not for lack of talent or skill or luck, but for sheer determination and hard work. For the person that lives life at 209, no. Or 210, not even close. But for the person who will live fully stretched out at 212 degrees. Kelly Wells is a person who lives life at 200. And 12 degrees. So back to our poem, right? But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious face, which to the boy so clearly said, get up and win the race. But he quickly rose, no damage done, behind a bit, that's all and ran with all his might and mind to make up for the fall. So anxious to restore himself, to catch up and win, his mind went faster than his legs, and he slipped and he fell again. He wished then that he'd quit before, with only one disgrace. He said, I'm hopeless as a runner now. I shouldn't try to race. So up he jumped to try again, 10 yards behind the last. If I'm going to gain those yards, he thought, I've got to move real fast. Exerting everything he had, he regained eight or ten, but trying hard to catch the lead, he slipped and he fell again. Which brings us to this point. Get up each time you fall. You will fall and you will fall and you will fall, but life will define you. Life will write about you not because of the times that you fall, but by every time that you got back up. This person here in the, in, the, um, in the picture, his name is Secretary Alfonso Jackson. He was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. So this is a guy who marched in the Civil Rights Movement, who marched across bridges and had um, fire hoses unleashed on him, had dogs unleashed on him. And I was in his office one day in Washington, D.C., and he, and he lifted up his pant leg, and he showed me the scars from bite marks left by dogs. Um, but he wasn't bitter. And he offered a very simple phrase that I offer to you all. He said, Lucas, life will deal you a lot of blows and they'll deal you a lot of obstacles. But if you can look up, you can get up. He was knocked, on, knocked down on a lot of bridges with fire hoses. He was bitten by dogs. And he was pushed down to the ground a lot. But he also became Secretary of Housing and Urban Development because of not the dogs or the fire hoses or the challenges of that moment, but because he was willing to Look up. So I offer to you in your races and, and what you're, you're focused on right now and the challenges that you all deal with, if you can look up, you can get up. And you all know uh, a few of these folks. George Washington lost the first five battles of the Revolutionary War. Beethoven's competition teacher, Beethoven's blind, right, tells him you will never be able to learn how to play the piano. Walt Disney had no advantages, no money. No high school diploma. Walt Disney went bankrupt 12 times. He had two nervous breakdowns. And there were times when everything seemed stacked against this guy. But he would look up. He would get up. And because he did, there probably is not a person who is of media consumption age across the entire world that doesn't know what the brand Walt Disney represents. And it's not just what we see here in Central Florida or, or in, in Disneyland in California, it's, it's news, it's sports teams, it's global, because one person refused to give up. Life has, a, life has a few rules, right? Number one, never quit, and rule number two, always remember rule number one. Defeat, he lay there silently, a tear dropped from his eye, there's no sense in running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out, why try? The will to rise had disappeared. 
All hope had fled away. So far behind, so error prone, a loser all the way. I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who'd assume he'd have to face. Get up, an echo sounded low. Get up and take your place. You were not meant for failure here. Get up and win the race. With borrowed will, get up, it said, because you haven't lost it all. For winning is no more than this, to rise each time you fall. So up he rose to run once more and with a new commit. He resolved that win or lose this race, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the air others now, the most he'd ever been, still he gave it all he had and run as though to win. I shared with you before about the different obstacles that I had in life. Flunking kindergarten, seeing all my friends move on as I was standing still, having my mom talk to me about, about deciding that I was built for something more, deciding to believe in the possible, deciding to, to want to win more than I was afraid to fail, and deciding to, to get up each time I fell. I took mom at her word, and with a lot of help, just like you have a lot of mentors, a lot of teachers, a lot of family and friends that are trying to help you, I was able to turn with a lot of help and by the grace of God, flunking kindergarten into being valedictorian in my high school class because I refused to quit, because I lived life at a higher level whenever I could. And I'll be the first one to admit, I have not always followed mom's two keys to success, which are that I could do anything I put my mind to, that you can do anything you put your mind to, and that we always remember who we are and who we represent. That that means integrity, that that means ethics, that that means living a life of honor and decency at all times and in all places. And I'll be the first one to admit that I haven't always followed mom's two keys of success. But I can tell you that as I have, and when I have, even the difficult times, when, when I reached a goal only to have to have that dream deferred, those were the times I look back on now and say, man, I learned a lot. And I'm thankful that I kept going. I kept going, I kept dreaming, and you saw this picture in the beginning. But uh, this is the very first time I met the former president. It's March 25th, 2002. I am 22 years old. I'm a sophomore, junior in college. It's six months after 9-11. They aren't maybe gonna have internships after 9-11 because of the security threat. Um, and at the last moment, decide to have these internships. I, out of 100, uh, or I was one of 100 students, one of 2,000 applications that they chose, um, and was sent to, to, to the White House. I thought this, this is the fulfillment of my dream, right? You know, if you think of any given time, there are 300 million Americans. At any given time, there are 200, 250 of them that work at the White House. You know, and then when you think about the number of people that can fly in a plane, maybe 20, 25 that fly with the president on any given day. So when you think about the odds of accomplishing the different things that I had set out to do, pretty extraordinary. This day made it possible. I'm, I'm walking back from lunch. It's a Monday. It's a spring day in, in Washington, D.C. My boss comes around the corner, and he kind of gives me this cryptic advice. He says, Lucas, somebody's going to call you on the phone. They're going to ask you to do something. My advice to you is to just say yes, all right? Then he walks away. Kind of cryptic. No clue what he's talking about. But as an intern, you know, you do what you're told, right? So I get this call on the phone. It's the USA Freedom Corps, an initiative the president started after 9-11 to increase volunteer service across, across the nation. I remember the advice of my boss. And I'm like, sure, no problem. They rush me over to the West Wing, take off my suit and my tie. They put this T-shirt on me. And then they say, all right, we're here. And then they bring out these kids. These kids are like 8, 10, and 12. I'm 22. And I'm not complaining about being on the South Lawn, right? But I'm kind of scratching my head. I'm like, what am I doing hanging out? You know, I know I look young, but why am I hanging out with a bunch of 8-year-olds <laughs> on the South Lawn? No clue this was with the president. Secret Service guys show up. You know, they got the serious expressions, dark glasses, earpieces, guns on their hips. I'm like, whoa, what's going on, right? Oval Office is just there in, in the background. The president walks out of the Oval. He starts kind of going up to the kids, and he kind of gets to me. And I'm like, I'm excited. I was born and raised in Independence, Missouri, right? 
Never met anybody famous in my entire life. He kind of sticks his hand out. He's like, hey, I'm George. And I responded in the only real way I knew how. I'm like, well, what up, man? I'm Lucas, right? <laughs> and he, he probably got the same kick out of it that you guys did. And because he didn't have a lot in common with, you know, the 8 and 10 and 12-year-olds on, on the grounds, we're taking these photos, and we just start chopping it up, start talking. 10, 15 minutes on the South Line. So right after 9-11, he starts, you know, talking about all these different things, asking me what I'm doing, who I work for, you know, and it goes by in a blur, right? It's, this is with Parade Magazine. I start to walk away um, after this photo shoot ends, and he calls me over for this photo. And as you can see, I was really, really excited because I pull him in for the brother hug, right? <laughs> Afterwards, I shake his hand again, and I'm like, sir, you know, I'm praying for you. This is right after 9-11, and I think that's it. I go home. Mind you, in 2002, we did not have Twitter. Uh, we did not have Facebook. We did not have Instagram. So I could think of one person on the face of the planet to update my status with, and that's mom. Right? So I call her. I'm like, mom, I just met the president. I'm excited. I think that's it. Just a really cool day on the South Lawn. Two more months before the internship's over, I'll go home, get a law degree, something like that, right? Next day, my boss comes back from a meeting with the president. Kind of scratches his head, and he's like, Lucas, um, you know, you made a real impression on the president yesterday. I start sweating bullets, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, man, the Secret Service ratted me out. I'm in trouble. I'm about to lose my internship. It's like, I'm sorry. I start apologizing. Like, I'm really sorry. I was really excited. I didn't mean to pull him in for the hug. I'm really. He's like, he's like, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. He's like, you know, he calls me over after this meeting in the Oval Office, and he's like, hey, you know, I met this guy in the South Lawn yesterday. What's his name again? He said, well, his name's Lucas. And, and the president responds, well, I really enjoyed meeting him. What's his story? And boss proceeds to tell him about my background, some of the things I've shared with you all about growing up in foster care, um, then being a White House intern. And the president did something that set my career on fire. He said, well, what can we do for him? Let's bring him on board, right? I share that story with you all for, for two reasons. Number one, it, it drives home my mom's second key to success, which is that we always remember who we are and who we represent. I was nobody. I was an intern, working for free, right? Working for free, was not Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, a world leader, and he took the time to just chat. As you guys think about the next 5, 10, 20 years of your life, if you're willing to live life at 212 degrees, if you're willing to be authentic and be real with everyone you meet, these types of moments turn into even bigger moments. And I had no clue that just being myself being real, being authentic would lead to this. this. The, the other reason I share that with you is because it drives home this, this notion of character, right? I wasn't anybody, and he took the time to just chat. The next day, I had the presence of mind to remember some random kid that he met on the South Lawn, and then went one step further and said, get him a job. And when I think about, you know, President Barack Obama gets up probably 5.30, 6 a.m. every day and runs through the day, got tons of things on his schedule. All kinds of people trying to hug him, fist bump him, take photos with him. So for any president uh, to remember some random kid that he meets during a 15-minute photo opportunity is pretty incredible. What is out of this world is for him to, re to follow up, and, and then what is even more incredible is for him to go one step further and say, get him a job. I share that story with you because you never know who's watching. Guys, juniors, seniors, sophomores, getting ready for internships, you never know who's watching. And as you try and look at both obstacles and opportunities along this race, understand that there will always be people out there who may be in a position to help you get to where you've already decided in your mind and in your heart you want to go. So I took these obstacles. I, I lived life at 212 degrees, and I had a lot of help. And over the course of about five years, I went home, finished college, went back and worked on the presidential campaign was in charge of African-American outreach for the former president, um, was in charge of professional sports outreach. So anytime an NBA team or an NFL team came to the, to the White House, I was in charge of their visit. Um, an incredible time. And then I was promoted to this position that had me in charge of 10 states, from Missouri all the way to California. So anytime the president traveled to one of those states, I was in charge of his trip. So that meant that I had two Blackberries, right? RIM was actually a legitimate company back in 2008. <laughs> it's about to go off the brink now. Um, iPhones are in now, I get it. But I um, had two of these Blackberries. I worked 18-hour days, but that also meant that I flew with the president on Air Force One. This is us in, on the way to Nebraska in front of the plane in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I kind of joke with people, um, you know, this, this bottom one, 
I have no clue where that was taken. I just need to prove I was on the plane. So I had a friend take that photo. For willing to want to win more than we're afraid to fail, for willing to never quit, for willing to decide to weed the gardens of our lives, if we're willing to decide that we are built for something more, powerful things can happen. And of course, I stand before you today as the director of our Community Relations Department, our Government Affairs Department, and our Multicultural Insights Initiative for the Orlando Magic. No, it is not the Chicago Bulls, but it is an amazing, amazing place to work, and it's probably one of the best ownership groups in professional sports. You guys have a DeVos sports management program on this campus as a result of our owner. And they believe to their core that when it comes to this community, every day has to be game day. Which means if you boil down my job in a very simple few, few, few phrases, I help people. I make impact. Whether that's tickets for underserved communities or, or at-risk children that would never be able to come to a game, or whether that's launching our, our L Magic initiative with our big team at the Orlando Magic, our marketing department, and trying to reach out to all the different demographics across Central Florida, whether that's the t-shirts that you see shot out in the crowd every night, whether that's trying to ensure that those t-shirts are produced by women and minority-owned businesses, I help people. And it is one of the best jobs anybody could ever have um, that has a, a heart that is for service, right? Five decisions. Decide that you're built for something more. Decide to believe in the possible. Decide to live life at 212 degrees. Decide to want to win each time and want to win more than you're afraid to fail. And most importantly, decide to get up every time you fall. Three times he'd fallen stumbling. Three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win, he still ran to the end. They cheered the winning runner as he crossed the line first place. Head high and proud and happy, no falling, no failing, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line last place, you would have thought he'd won the race to hear the crowd. And even though he came in last, with head bent low and proud, you would have thought he listened, you would have thought he won the race to listen to the crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, No, I didn't do too well. To me, you won, his father said. You rose each time you fell. Decide to believe that you're built for something more. Decide to believe in the possible. Decide to want to win more than you're afraid to fail. Decide to live life at a higher level than everybody else. And last but not least, and most importantly, every time you fall, if you can look up, you can get up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Your mom uh, helped you out a lot when you were younger. What do you do now to help give back to her? Very, very good question. So mom is very, very shy. So I try and give her kudos at every moment of opportunity. Um, but what I've tried to do is I try to pay it forward. So on a, a number of different boards, uh, I, I chair the governor's um, state advisory group. So it focuses on, uh, it's with the Department of Juvenile Justice, and it focuses on children who are at risk um, who might be at risk to being in the system to try and provide programming, um, help programs and help organizations that are trying to help those children. Um, also, do a lot of speaking, do a lot of um, mentoring um, with this um, organization called Take Stock in Children. It's to Valencia College. And uh, the, the program is, is the children come in in middle school. Each of them get a full-time mentor. And when they graduate from high school, they get a 2 plus 2 scholarship to Valencia and then to transfer here to UCF. Um, and our foundation yesterday actually just gave them $100,000 to continue that mission. Um, serve on the um, Orange County Department of Children and Family Services. And one of the specific things that they do is they oversee a foster care home um, here in Orange County. And so I do a lot of work with those foster care children um, to try and share my story with them and, and 
a lot of these guys, when they're in a foster care group home, and I understand I was very, very blessed, so because I was in the same foster care home that I then ended up being adopted into. A lot of our at-risk children and our, and our foster care students will go through five, ten different foster care homes, and they will literally turn 18 without a family. And so I really try and focus on the teenage population. A lot of other boards and stuff, too. Yes, sir. What keeps you motivated? My mom and my faith. You know, uh, she has just instilled and sacrificed a great deal for all of her children. You know, and so I want to try and make her proud. Um, I think that keeps me motivated. And then people, you know, you guys, you know, you guys literally are the leaders not just of the next generation, but this generation. Uh, engineering, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, you guys are needed not tomorrow or in five years, you guys are needed today. You know, so if I could do anything to help prepare leaders of today and tomorrow, that keeps me motivated. But it's really, I think, all of us, and, and we all have different motivations in life, but for me, other people and helping other people uh, keeps me going every day. Over here. Yes, sir. You mentioned that there were times when you had, you were living life at 195 and 196 and so on, but working with the best and you could not afford such. How did you go through it? Like, how did you manage to put your best even when you had that? Situation? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't always live at 212. And one thing in particular, which is why I shared with you that specific statement of want to win more than you're afraid to fail. You know, so we're all college students. Some of us are here on, on scholarships. Some of us have financial aid. And I came out of school, worked for a presidential campaign for like $24,000 a year, age 24, in Washington, D.C. So I made no money. You know, and even going to the White House, you think, oh, wow, cool, you're going to make all this money. Mm -mm, that's your tax money, right? So we don't get paid a lot to work at the White House. It's a cool thing to do. And it's a really unique blessing, but uh, I was making maybe $28,000 at age 25, 26. And there was a, I, li I write about this in my book. Um, there was a time when I, I made it to the White House. Seven months later, I had to walk away. Um, and it was the, one of the hardest times of my life. And when I talk to you about obstacles, this isn't just some pie in the sky thing that I'm talking about that maybe everybody goes through. I've been through this stuff, right? So I literally had to walk away from one of the, the, the driving motivations or forces that I thought about since I was maybe 12, 13, 14 years of age. And uh, it was a real difficult time. And at the time, I was so afraid of failing that I wasn't willing to live life fully stretched out, right? And I resolved, I was able to, with a lot of help and a lot of grace, you know, working at the White House once in, once in your life is really a lifetime experience, once in a lifetime experience. So to have the the unique fortune to be able to return um, for a, a quote-unquote second tour of duty with the same president was a, a absolute act of grace. And I remember walking up the steps of the executive office building, which is this huge building that's right next to the West Wing and the, and the, and the actual mansion that you see on TV. And I remember thinking these thoughts, want to win more than you're afraid to fail. And they'll never just give up on a dream because of some obstacles or something like that, right? Um, and that's what that taught me, you know, working there and having to walk away and go through this dark time. And it also framed that thought for me as well that, you know, some of the best times in our life are preceded by some times of enormous sacrifice and some dark clouds. Way back here. One more? All right, one more in the back. The dreads. Great question. Plan B. So if I don't get this internship, uh, I was actually, it was interesting because I told you the, the White House was actually not going to have internships. So my, they were actually almost the plan B. Um, I ended up uh, with, a, with a, an internship with a congressman and had already signed the papers and was going. And literally two weeks before I was going to go to Washington, D.C., um, the White House called and said, hey, we got your resume in a pile here. I know we haven't been, we've been very slow as you can imagine with you know, the terrorist attacks and things like that, would you like to come, right? So that was almost, you know, I was already making this plan B, that at least B in, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, second question was, what was it? What was your plan B if you didn't? And so, and let me tell you this other story, right? So I'm at the White House, it's a year before we, we're leaving, and uh, someone comes up to me and they're like, 
hey, you've done a great job. We're getting ready to leave. We've got a year left. What do you want to do next? You know? And I thought of all the standard answers like, hey, you know, I want to, um, uh, I should probably get an MBA or go get a JD, a law degree, you know, something like that. But then something in my heart just said, hey, tell me your dream. I was like, you know, actually, I've always wanted to work for an NBA team. And he's like, really? I used to work for the Dallas Mavericks. I had no clue that this guy had worked for an NBA team, right? And that person was literally the person that connected me to the Orlando Magic that brought me here four years ago. So the, the, the principle that I'm trying to convey there is, is tell people what you're going after because you never know who's going to be in a position to help you get to where you want to go. Um, and I had no clue how I was going to do any of these things, right? There, always the plan B was education or really the plan A should always be continuing education. And that was the bedrock and I knew I'd be okay with the education um, and, and the rest was just gravy. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, obliterate your obstacles. Get up and win the race, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.